Madam, Madam Ambassador, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to open this uh, conference, a, a virtual conference with real people, uh, the first we've had for quite a while, uh, and on an important topic. The FW Research Foundation decided to arrange this conference to consider the principles that should guide South Africa's foreign policy. Should our foreign policy be based on the values in the Constitution? To what extent should we consider old loyalties and friendships? Or should foreign policy be, be, foreign policy be based on a pragmatic assessment of South Africa's perceived national interests? If foreign policy should be determined by a combination of these factors, what weighting should be given to it? We are considering this question against the background of the present war in Ukraine and the policy of neutrality that our government has adopted. We regard the Ukraine war as being of particular importance to South Africa's foreign policy because, it, its course, because of its core significance for the conduct of international relations in the present era. The war is, perhaps, the most critical development in the international arena since the disintegration of the Soviet Union at the beginning of the 1990s, an event with which it is inextricably linked. The war demands our attention for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is a dramatic departure from the world order that we had hoped had emer emerged after the Second World War and that rested on international law and the proposition that no nation should invade another nation, particularly with a view to seizing territory. Indeed, there have been very few such wars in recent decades, which despite the conflicts in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, have been among the most peaceful in human history. Secondly, the outcome of the invasion of Ukraine is dangerously open-ended and unpredictable. There is a serious possibility that the conflict might escalate that NATO might eventually be faced with a prospect of either having to increase its involvement in the war or face the very unpalatable consequences of a Russian victory. And if Russian aggression against Ukraine succeeds, would President Putin not be tempted to attack the Baltic states and other former components of the old Soviet Union? Finally, there is the threat of nuclear weapons. The stability that characterized the nuclear standoff between the West and the Soviet Union may no longer exist. Russia has not hesitated to flex its nuclear muscles in warning NATO not to become involved in the conflict. It apparently has a nuclear doctrine of escalating to de-escalate. We must remember that Russia, apart from its land-based missiles, has 10 nuclear submarines with 160 missiles and uh, 1,600 independently targeted warheads, quite enough to destroy civilization. So, in our opinion, the war in Ukraine is by far the world's most serious international issue. It has upended the world order based on international law uh, and the peaceful resolution of disputes. It holds within it disturbing possibilities for escalation and raises once again the terrible specter of nuclear conflict. South Africa's response to the war is accordingly of more than passing interest. Our speakers today will deal with this critically important question 
Advocate Mark Oppenheimer will address the need for South Africa's foreign policy to reflect the values in our constitution. Towards that third consideration, what's best for the ANC? Or what's a good way of keeping these crimes committed uh, in Sudan, uh, encouraging uh, war crimes and rape? Uh, and South Africa takes this uh, odd attitude to protecting him, so much so that um, litigation is brought so that Bashir will be arrested and he's instead secreted out of the country. There's a sense that South Africa says, well, we thumb our noses at these international statutes. And uh, for a number of years took the view that South Africa should withdraw and, and wanted to encourage other African nations to withdraw from the ICC. For a strange purported reason, the idea that the International Criminal Court um, persecutes Africans by spending time um, prosecuting the worst offenders. It's a very strange line to have. Uh, imagine if people said, well, you're persecuting uh, Yugoslavians um, or Germans when you set up special tribunals like the Nuremberg Tribunal or the, uh, the Tribunal in Yugoslavia. You'd say, no, you're fighting for the rights of the victims of those evil regimes. And so that's the purpose of an international criminal court is to hold uh, dictators and war criminals to account for the horrible crimes that they've performed against their citizens. And in many recent years, those citizens have been African. And so South Africa takes this, this odd stance on that front. So what are the fundamental principles in the South African constitution that could be this light onto other nations? Well, freedom, dignity, and equality are our foundational norms. The other one that's often neglected in section one of the constitution is this value of non-racialism. And what that means is not just the prohibition on racism, but it's this more fundamental idea that when we assess each other, we do so based on the content of our characters, not the color of our skin, drawing from Martin Luther King's famous line. And this is undoubtedly a, a value that's important and one that has been uh, swiftly abandoned by the ANC domestically and I'd say abroad as well. One of the other fundamental rights for any democracy to prosper is the right of property. And what we've seen is a sustained attack on our domestic uh, constitutional rights to the property that the ANC has tried for many years to amend our constitution to allow the government to confiscate people's private property. Thankfully, that constitutional amendment has failed. But it also has international ramifications. One of the uh, biggest trading partners for South Africa is the United States. And we benefit from AGOA, which provides preferential access to their markets. South Africa exports roughly 200 billion rands worth of goods to America. And if we were to erode our constitutional our property rights protections, there's a very good chance that AGOA would have been uh, cancelled for us, that we would no longer be a beneficiary of it. Furthermore, of course, it jeopardizes all of the American businesses uh, and other European businesses who run in South Africa, that their property could very well be confiscated by the state. So our domestic concerns also play a role with regards to our international uh, relations with other nations, and those are being jeopardized. So there's a sense here in which we can see that what's good on a pragmatic level, like fostering relations with our biggest trading partners, can also coincide with the human rights account of protecting property rights. One of the values closest to my heart and much of the work that I do is around free speech. And if we think how important this free speech right is, the ability of people with dissenting views to be able to express them without uh, a concern that they're going to be jailed for it, uh, if we think about the awful amounts of censorship that happened during apartheid, that it's an important value to be enshrined in our constitution and one that's um, quite maximal in its protections. We have very few limitations uh, on free speech in South Africa, one of which um, being hate speech. Now, in the international arena, when the United Nations uh, had a resolution on this question about people being able to have, to freely express their ideas um, and to engage in uh, public protest of those ideas, uh, South Africa abstained. Um, so instead of endorsing the values that are in our constitution, South Africa decided not to endorse those values in the public arena. We were also one of the early nations um, to guarantee protections for the gay community. So if you look at section nine of our constitution, which is the equality clause, 
it lists a number of groups which are given protection, uh, and sexual orientation is specifically listed. We were the fifth country in the world to um, have gay marriage, and many other nations have followed our lead. But in the international arena, when there was a resolution um, to protect people from being um, victimized or subject to violence on the grounds of sexual orientation, instead of South Africa saying, this is an important value, this is something that we ourselves have driven, uh, that we care about on a domestic level and other countries ought to care about it too, again, South Africa abstains. We also see that there's a sidling up to some of the most sinister regimes in the world. So regimes that are happy to practice uh, torture, um, kidnapping of people, to suppress the rights of journalists or their citizens. We could reflect the values that are in our constitution. We have the right to dignity, we have the right to bodily integrity, which specifically talks about um, people not being tortured and how you have a right not to be tortured. Something which should be at close to the hearts of uh, many members of the ANC who were themselves tortured um, during the, the struggle against apartheid. But we find that when the UN calls for these nations to be condemned, South Africa sits back and does nothing about it. With regards to what's in the current ANC's foreign policy document, we get a sense of where the allegiances lie. The document says that unilateral sanctions against Iran, Syria, North Korea, Nicaragua, Russia and Venezuela uh, and, and Cuba are perfect examples of the bullying conduct that is intensifying. In other words, these poor little nations who are being bullied, these are rogue nations. These are some of the most sinister nations one can think of. That if we think about the atrocities that are committed in North Korea, um, that the human rights record of Iran is utterly abysmal that if you are gay in Iran, you are subject to being pushed off a building because of it. That the actions of Russia uh, have become more and more sinister over time, and I will speak in some detail about the, the current um, war in Ukraine. And then of course, if we think about Venezuela, instead of condemning what the Venezuelan government has done to its own people, remember that two and a half million people were driven into exile because of their abysmal uh, economic policies, that people are on the Maduro diet, which is a, a polite way of talking about losing 30 kilos because you can't eat, um, a crisis that has not just affected Venezuela, but neighboring countries who've had to absorb all those people who've been driven into exile. Instead of condemning that conduct, what the ANC government does is try and emulate it by changing our constitution in a similar manner to um, the amendment done by Chavez, allowing the state to have this power to confiscate property. With regards to Cuba, again, a communist nation which has oppressed its people, um, which has one of the lowest access to internet in the world, um, which had a, a single dictator for a long period of time, the South African attitude towards it is to say, my friends, can we give you money? We know that our people are starving, we know that we can't pay our own social grants, but uh, we'd like to give you 50 million rand. And of course it takes an organization like AfriForum to take them to court to halt the payment of South Africa's funds to this regime. And how does the ANC regard what happened in Venezuela? Well, through a very strange lens. Again, in their policy document they say, imperialist, imperialist designs also continue to manifest in support of the right wing in Latin America. Nowhere is this felt more brutally than in Venezuela, whose economy has been wrecked through a combination of sanctions and sabotage, further deepening internal weaknesses and contradictions. This has led to a sharp rise in inflation, poverty, and hunger. So instead of confronting the reality that it's Venezuela's own domestic policy which led to the suffering, the claim is, well, it's those evil imperialists in the West who've imposed sanctions, uh, and that's why things have gone south in Venezuela. Now, interestingly, one of the tools in the ANC's arsenal uh, in the fight against the apartheid was a call for sanctions against the apartheid regime. But now that it's in power, it has voted with Russia, Venezuela, and uh, Saudi Arabia 
to oppose the use of economic sanctions by one state against another. So what's good for the goose isn't good for the gander. That instead of saying there are certain principles that are important to use, that being able to coerce a state into treating its citizens with dignity, with fairness, um, with freedom, and that sanctions are a useful way of encouraging that, South Africa says, no, we don't support that. Closer to home, when sanctions would have been quite useful in dealing with the atrocities committed by Zim the Mugabe regime against the citizens of Zimbabwe, South Africa adopted a quiet diplomacy approach. This idea, well, we were brothers in the liberation movement, and we shouldn't be too harsh uh, against what you're doing to your own people. Now, if we think about, again, the erosion of property rights in Zimbabwe, it didn't just affect the farmers who lost their land. It affected all citizens that Zimbabwe is on the record for having the world's worst case of hyperinflation, that it was cheaper to use Zimbabwean notes than to go and buy toilet paper, that 90% of people were driven into unemployment. We think our electricity situation is abysmal. In Zimbabwe, they have um, more time without power than with power. And of course, it's created an enormous refugee crisis. So many Zimbabweans seeking a better life fled that country and came to our country and have prospered. And of course, this has led to other tensions. So as uh, we've entered into our own economic troubles, people are being scapegoated. And the people that are being scapegoated are often Zimbabweans. There are calls from South Africa first style parties saying that Zimbabweans must be forced to leave, um, that they're often persecuted. If we think about the number of xenophobic attacks that have happened in South Africa, people being burned alive, um, people being uh, tortured and killed. The South African government has been very poor about dealing with this crisis, um, often doesn't condemn xenophobic attacks in the right terms, and has created a climate which has often led to these, these divisions. So one might say, well, maybe South Africa just takes this view of saying, leave us out of it. We're just, not, we're just going to abstain generally. We're not going to make proclamations about what happens in other states. But that's not what we find. So there's one nation in particular who is often singled out for rebuke by the South African government. That's the nation of Israel. Not only has South Africa taken a avowedly pro-Palestinian stance, which may be defensible, it has specifically invited Hamas to come to ANC conferences. Now, for those of you who don't know, um, Israel has, is, is on one side has the Gaza Strip and on the other side has the West Bank. Um, the PLO, or the Palestinian Authority, are in the West Bank and Hamas are in Gaza. And Hamas are widely regarded as a terrorist organization by uh, the European Union, by America, by Australia. Um, they are willing to uh, specifically target civilians, uh, launching rockets, kidnapping soldiers, uh, are widely re reviled as an organization, um, even by the Palestinian Authority. But the ANC government welcomed Hamas to South Africa. We'll call them friends. It would even ruin the life of uh, a young black South African girl who won Miss South Africa, who was invited to participate in Miss World, which happened to be held in Israel. And they condemned her, and they tried to force her not to go to Israel. Uh, and she defied them. She said, you know, this is an important thing that I want to do. And she went to Israel and she competed in Miss World and I think she came third. And there was a backlash against the ANC for saying, why are you taking your hatred uh, for Israel out on this poor young girl? This girl who represents South Africa in a world forum. South Africa has downgraded its, its embassy um, with Israel. It's condemned um, Israel's observer status in the AU. And often uh, out of kilter with what's what's been happening in the international arena with Israel. So if we think about the Abraham Accords, Israel has managed to do peace deals with um, many of its former adversaries to great gain for those nations. And um, that those nations that signed up to the Abraham Accords were often the fastest to provide vaccines during the COVID crisis. That Israel being a small state um, has incredible technological abilities. So South Africa has missed out um, on getting access to desalination plants which would have been incredibly useful during the water crisis in the Western Cape uh, when we got very close to a day zero. And 
is an ongoing crisis in the Eastern Cape where people don't have water. And so these are issued. So one might say, well, there's something different about Israel. This is a country that you know, has disputed territories. Maybe the ANC just cares about occupied people and that they would uh, denounce that. But of course the ANC is silent on Tibet. That when Desmond Tutu invited the Dalai Lama out, um, someone who's a, regarded as a champion of peace, he was denied a visa. That when the, the Chinese persecute a Muslim minority of Uyghurs, again, South Africa is silent. And of course, we must then think about the current conflict, which has many ramifications for South Africa and the rest of the world, the conflict in Russia and Ukraine. Now, to her credit, Naledi Pandor came out very quickly um, calling for Russian troops to be withdrawn from Ukraine. But this position was walked back. South Africa took the view that it wouldn't uh, say something so harsh as that. The UN resolutions that were made, which South Africa abstained from, um, were signed up to by most nations in the world. They expressed grave concern for attacks on, on, on civilian facilities like schools and hospitals, the killing of um, women and children, people with disabilities. Um, the UN recognized that the military operations in Russia inside the sovereign territory of Ukraine are on a scale that the international community has not seen in Europe in decades and that urgent action is needed to save this generation from the scourge of war. Now, the question is, given the ANC approach to sinister regimes and sinister actions and its deviation from a human rights policy, can any of this be explained away by saying, well, this is what's in South Africa's pragmatic interest? I don't think so. I don't think that an ongoing war in Ukraine is good for South African citizens. As Nancy mentions, it's led to massive escalations uh, in prices, inflation around the world, s surging cost in fuel, which is going to be felt by the poorest of the poor the most strenuously. Why sidle up to Russia? Well, the ANC has had a friendly relationship with the Russians during, um, during apartheid that um, many figures were trained in Russia. Jacob Zuma, um, when he believed that he was poisoned, flew out to Russia and believed that he was cured by Russians, that when we pursued nuclear, it was with the Russians. But as a trading partner with South Africa, Russia doesn't even fall into our top 25. It's less than a fraction of a percent. So in terms of South Africans on the ground, how important is our relationship with Russia? Not very important. It's important for uh, the ruling party's prior loyalties. And so my argument is that instead of focusing on its prior loyalties, South Africa should first care about human rights, be a light unto other nations by thinking
accepted uh, post-1991, I think, are, uh, have been for some time, but I think the war in Ukraine is that tipping point moment where, uh, where, uh, where, where things are un unraveling. And what has become much more apparent is that uh, we're living in a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world, and here I'm copying from, uh, from management speak and uh, the VUCA. Uh, concept, which I think the war in Ukraine uh, and, and the ensuing uh, global environment has, uh, has made more, uh, more acute. And this is on the back of fraying multilateralism, a paralysis that we have seen, not just in the way in which the UN Security Council operates, but in the way in which organizations like the WTO uh, operate or not. A growing contestation of the rules and norms that have not dominated the rules-based uh, international system. Um, and this has been largely because of the rise of China and because of the rise of other countries in the global south. Um, and it speaks to, to some of the, uh, of, of the debates that were being had in, uh, certainly in the 1990s and in the early 2000s that said that the current liberal international order is an open one, it's an inclusive one, it's, it's one that allows new powers to rise and that therefore the system is, doesn't need to be replaced. It, it, it doesn't pose a threat to rising powers like China uh, and indeed other developing countries. Uh, this is a theory that, that I can very... Uh, U.S. academic uh, argued, and of course before that we had the end of history idea of, of, of Frank Fukuyama. What we have seen in, in probably the last decade is that that isn't the case, that there are a lot of rules that countries in the developing world believe need to be changed. They are not fair, they do not reflect their particular interests and their particular concerns. Um, and now that they have greater economic power and political power, uh, their ability to contest these rules becomes, becomes more, uh, stronger. And I raise all of these because these are all relevant for also understanding where South Africa is positioning itself in the broader global, global debate. Um, and I think going forward, it probably will be true to say, which is why it's very volatile, uncertain, ambiguous and complex, that whereas in the 1990s and the early 2000s we thought the global order was going to be one that was uh, harmonized and you, you know we were all going to adopt universal values um, is, is probably going to be defined in, in the next uh, few decades as highly heterogeneous um, where global value systems are not uh, uh, the word global uh, will not be attached next to value system um, I think you will find uh, uh, the emergence of parallel systems and, and value systems. And that certainly, I would argue, for small countries like South Africa is a problem. But I'll come back to that later. So I've, I've sort of uh, sketched that because I think understanding these changes and trends
2007, talking about pragmatic idealism. And he said, while firmly grounded in values, pragmatic idealism appreciates the complexity of the real world, uh, a world uh, of hard choices and painful trade-offs. This is the real world in which we must live, we must decide, and we must act. Okay. He says, values are important, uh, but they're not the only thing uh, that you have to deal with. And fundamentally, he says, domestic support is very vital for any successful foreign policy. I would argue in, in, in the South African context, uh, although it's, it's probably also the case in many other countries, foreign policy is, is, is of relevance and important to a small group of people. Uh, and it becomes relevant to a much bigger group of people when we have issues, for example, like uh, um, uh, uh, immigrants and xenophobia and so on. Um, but in other, in other cases, it's, 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 it's a much smaller group of people that we're talking about. So let's, let's just move then and say, well, if we're talking about a pragmatic foreign policy, what are, what, what are, we, what are the characteristics, what are the features of, of such a foreign policy uh, and that would enable us to be really responsive and smart about our pragmatism. So firstly, and I've already sp spoken to that, ability to see many moves ahead. Appreciating the importance of structural shifts globally and how they are likely to impact on a country. Ability to assess the costs of trade-offs. Um, foreign relations does have a transactional element. Let's, 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 uh, let's, uh, let's not uh, ignore that. So, Support for one measure, and here I'm, I'm referring to a really interesting article that uh, Nicole Fritz wrote for a, a volume we produced uh, a couple of years ago. Sometimes supporting one measure that denies certain rights, uh, where the opposition opposing it would not have changed the outcome, while leverage might allow you to leverage support for another one where rights are upheld. You need to be able, and the executive, and the argument here was about the power of courts, but the executive sometimes needs to have that space to maneuver uh, in, in implications, for example, of non-condemnation of an invasion of one country by another. Okay. What are the implications on international law and by extension on, on, on the way in which we operate and we may be affected in the global system? Um, so I would argue, for example, that preservation of international law is in the national interest. Uh, a rules-based order, particularly for small states uh, that do not have the ability to act unilaterally uh, 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 in, in the way that the US or Russia or, or China can do, uh, a rules-based system is fundamental and we have to protect and we have to reform it. I think we do have to recognize that we have to reform it, but that is important for us. <clears throat> I'm just perhaps going to run through some of the points around that we're all familiar with, I think, around the priorities and values of South Africa's foreign policy. I think we all know that the priorities have been articulated as being focused in the first instance on Africa, the second instance on the global south, uh, the importance of multilateralism, but a multilateralism that is fairer and more equitable. Um, our priorities talk about the importance of political and economic relations with the North, but those are number four or number five in the, in the list of priorities. Um, and very much also the, the importance of South-South cooperation. And here I just want to pause a little bit, because we talk about values in the Constitution, which are about human rights, justice, uh, democracy, um, and, and, and so on. But there are another set of values that the government... Uh, identifies and recognizes, and which sometimes trump the values that are in the Constitution around human rights, etc. And these are the South-South cooperation principles, which at one level are really about uh, reasserting developing countries uh, 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 in opposition to colonialism, but in another we know have become, uh, have become problematic because they shield, they act as shields. Uh, uh, to, to, to misgovernance and violation of rights in, in, in countries in the developing South. And what are these principles? Respect for national sovereignty, national ownership and independence, equality, non-conditionality, non-interference in domestic affairs and mutual benefit, 
And I think these are, have been at various times brought to, to the fore in arguing South Africa's position uh, in, 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 some, uh, in, in some instances and in some decisions that it, that it has taken. I think it is fair to say that uh, for, for small countries, because South Africa is a small country, uh, our ability to operate in the world is, is not as open or as, 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 as free and independent as it might be for superpowers. But small countries obviously also do have leverage. Um, and there is a wonderful uh, book uh, that uh, uh, has been brought out by a, an Indian academic based in Germany that, call, that, is, that talks about the power of poverty narratives, where she argues about the role that uh, less developed countries and the power that less developed countries have been able to exercise in the WTO. So small countries do have power, but we have to operate, and our interest is in a rules-based international system. I think there are a couple of points that in, in considering our, prag our pragmatic approach we need to consider. We're geographically very far from some of our most important markets. We're also a country that straddles two oceans, although that's something that we haven't really uh, uh, considered uh, in, in a significant way in terms of being able to do something about it. Uh, in, able to, in order to be able to patrol, in order to be able to project uh, influence uh, and norms around the development of, of maritime, maritime issues. There is economic potential in the region, but parts of the continent are very volatile. So there are issues here about how you settle disputes in order for us to be able to maximize uh, some of the opportunities that are critical to our national interest. There is also greater contestation of African leadership than there was in 1994. South Africa actually doesn't really have natural partners on the continent. You know, if I were to ask you, you know, who is South Africa's great buddy on the continent, you probably wouldn't necessarily be able to tell me, you know, these guys are, are firm brothers or sisters on this. And so what that means is that in the way in which we engage on a lot of issues, including on governance and democracy, there is often a balancing act that South Africa plays in, uh, in, 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 the, in where it positions itself, so as not to upset the Africa group. Because a lot of its legitimacy in the way in which it operates in the international environment, whether it is its role in the G20 or in the BRICS or whatever, actually comes from, the, from Africa. Um, pragmatism, I think, is essential but it requires a depthness. It requires analytical clarity. It requires the ability to execute and articulate positions unambiguously. And I would argue that while in some cases South Africa has been quite pragmatic over the last 25, 28 years, um, on some of the most contested issues, the way in which we have engaged has <laughs> created more problems than actually resolved. Uh, we haven't necessarily been adept. We haven't necessarily been on message. We haven't necessarily been analytically clear about what we, what we are saying and what we want to achieve. Uh, and, and that has led to a great deal of ambiguity. It's always interesting to watch uh, Indian uh, uh, officials from their Ministry of External Affairs uh, in, in terms of how they position uh, uh, India and the arguments they make. And they are very, very uh, 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 on point and, and, and on target. And they don't deviate. They're on message. And I think if the Ukraine uh, uh, experience is, is one thing to go by, there was a lot of ambiguity. Um, right at the beginning, uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs you know, declared that this was... Uh, the invasion uh, was, uh, was, uh, was a violation of international law. There was a lot of walking back. And then again, on the 8th of April, it said, you know, we do not justify the invasion. We do not condone the invasion. But by that time, all of the talk about neutrality, of course, had, I think, flown out of the window because there was so much that was being said that touted the Russian position, that talked about this is... NATO aggression, this is, this is Europe's war, 
this is NATO and Russia. This is not NATO. This is not uh, Russia and Ukraine. And that created a, an echo chamber of, of, I think, great confusion about why, what was our national interest in, in taking the position that we took. Um, I, I want to highlight, um, and, and then I'm sort of coming to, to, to a close, I, I, I want to highlight a couple of, of points that came out of the narrative that we heard from, uh, from the government as a whole uh, uh, during the last uh, three months. The first was about uh, South Africa has an independent and non-aligned foreign policy. Okay, we want to resist becoming in great power politics. We believe in the peaceful resolution of disputes. Okay? Uh, I think at the UNHRC, South Africa said that wars end when dialogues begin and wars endure when there is no dialogue. Okay. But were we really prepared and able and did we really understand the context in which the Russian invasion of Ukraine took place. And I would argue we were very naive. We've spoken about a fairer and more consistent multilateral system. And there you can't really fault South Africa, okay? Uh, uh, the, the multilateral system needs to be consistent in the application of a condemnation of violations of international law. And we, the system is not uh, always consistent. And South Africa has spoken about sanctions and regime change. And I think you already mentioned uh, the issue of sanctions and the aversion to sanctions, but equally the aversion to regime change. Uh, and there were echoes, unfortunately, in some of the narrative uh, from the West about regime change in Ukraine. And that was, uh, that was one of the red, that is, a, that is always a red flag for, uh, for South Africa. The last point I want to make about Ukraine values and pragmatism is, of course, the word hypocrisy has come up often, and it has come up on the side of, of South Africa talking about the inconsistency. But the point that I have made before here is that, uh, you know, if we were ourselves to be consistent in the same way that we condemned the invasion of Iraq, in the same way that we subsequently condemned the way in which Libya was handled, meant that, in fact, we could have handled what happened in Ukraine in exactly the same way and actually been true both to our principles and to the pragmatism around the importance of securing the multilateral uh, international order. Um, in, in, the last, uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, colleagues and I have been cooperating with some colleagues in Latin America around a new concept which uh, we've just brought out a little book on, which is called Active Non-Alignment, which I thought was a really interesting uh, way of, of looking at the way in which developing countries engage in international re relations in this current geopolitical context. It's, it's based on a book, or the concept is, is elaborated in a book in Spanish, unfortunately, uh, which is called Active Non-Alignment in Latin America, a Doctrine for the New Century. And it basically argues that as the world stumbles towards the second Cold War, developing nations realize that, it, that if they want to safeguard their autonomy, the last thing they need to do is to align themselves with either of the great powers. And they argue that it is about refusing to align automatically with one or another of the major powers. It's about putting their national interests first, but critically, it is not about equating it with neutrality. Now, this concept came out before the war in, in, in Ukraine, but it is picked up in, 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 in academic debates, and a little uh, booklet has come out that uh, covers uh, perspectives from different parts of, of the global south. Is active non-alignment then, and I pose this question, uh, a pragmatic option? Um, for any of you who follow India's uh, foreign uh, policy, um, there is a wonderful snippet that you can get on Twitter uh, with the Indian foreign minister who talks about, he doesn't understand why Europe's problems uh, must be our problems, but our problems are never Europe's problems. And he makes the point, I have my own side. Now this is India, this is, you know, what is it, the fifth or the sixth largest economy, one-fifth of the world's population. But this is the perspective that many 
countries in the global south are, are beginning to take. And it's a perspective that says, I, can, I don't want to take science because I believe I can benefit and I can have good relations with the US, and in the case of India, India is part of the Quad. And at the same time, I have issues with China, okay, Dok Lam, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and territorial uh, uh, disputes, but I have an economic relationship with China, and I can, I can still engage with China notwithstanding these problems, or indeed with Russia. And this is something that I think the Ukraine war has, has made more acute in terms of the, of the discussions. The fact that countries do not wish to be pushed into particular positions um, where they're either, you know, it's a case of, you know, you either favor me or you favor me. You know, do you love your father more than you love your mother kind of arrangement. Maybe that's not an entirely appropriate uh, an analogy, but um, nevertheless, uh, that, that's the point. And this is the point, I think, that has been articulated by South Africa as well. Naledi Pando's statements of, I think, the 8th of April, where she talks about, you know, uh, resisting becoming embroiled in the politics of confrontation and aggression that has been advocated by the powerful countries and seeking to assert our independent, non-aligned views and wishing to promote peaceful resolution of, of conflict through dialogue and negotiation. I do believe that there are times when peaceful resolution of disputes is not a pragmatic option, and I don't think <laughs> the circumstances that uh, we had to, uh, uh, th that we are now, most of us are, are very familiar with, uh, with the war in Ukraine, actually uh, uh, allow that uh, uh, to happen. But that is the position that they're taking, and they're taking, and many developing countries are taking that position because they also feel that on many of the issues that they feel very passionately about, the West in particular, and I think we need to understand that this is also seen as not just an invasion of Russia, uh, of, by Russia of Ukraine, but that this is actually a war between Russia and the West, that on many of the points that are important for developing countries, the West either sort of drags its feet or says that this is not an issue. Whether it's we're talking about vaccines, whether we're talking about some of the debates on taxation or illicit financial flows or on development finance, infrastructure financing, uh, a lot of those are coming from the East. Um, and, and at one level, therefore, that's a pragmatic uh, uh, approach uh, for, for developing countries to take. Um, let me then uh, end by sort of putting out some questions. Um, clearly, our economic national interests lie with the EU, the US, China. Uh, Russia is a very small economic uh, player in South Africa. Um, but there is another dimension, which is the principles of transformation of global governance, uh, a more effective and a, more, and a fairer one. Um, but violation of international law undermines that very principle. Right? So we want to push for greater reform, but at the same time, we shouldn't undermine some of the tenets of the global governance system. Has it been handled adeptly, if we believe uh, in, in negotiations, if we're talking about the way in which we've uh, engaged on Ukraine? Do we understand the context and the consequences? Are we being pragmatic about our potential to problem solve, uh, given the way that we have engaged on it? Uh, have we been able to see ahead and down the line in terms of what this Titan vendor uh, might mean for the global system in which we have to learn, uh, in which we have to survive uh, in the next, uh, over the next decade. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, pragmatism is always much more complex in principle. <laughs> uh, we'd now like to link to Professor Irina Filatova in Cape Town via Zoom. 
who will talk to us about South Africa's foreign policy on the Ukraine war specifically. And by the way, more information about our speakers is available in our program. So if Irina is with us, uh, I can see you, Irina, on this screen, but uh, we need to put it up on the screen in the conference room. Sorry, Arena, the inevitable technological glitches are being sorted out. We're almost there. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Do I need to mute myself or do I need just to turn off the volume on the computer? You, you can turn down the volume a little. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. 
Yes, that's great. Thank you. Do you want to? Well, thank you, Rena. Oh, then then I you. can't hear you. If uh, I turn off the volume, I can't hear you. Okay, Irina, thanks. Can you go ahead? Uh, we, we're, uh, we can see you and we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. And thank you for inviting me. It is uh, uh, a very interesting discussion and it's a great honor to participate in it. Uh, uh, it is difficult to be the third speaker because uh, so many things that I could or would have mentioned have already been said, have already been mentioned, and to some of them I shall have to, uh, uh, to uh, return when I speak. Uh, it is a pity that I cannot be there with you, and uh, it is also difficult to be just a talking head. That is why, for your entertainment, I have uh, uh, done a presentation which I would like to share with you. Uh, it does not exactly reflect what I'm going to speak about, but at least some instances and some pictures, bright pictures, will be there. Uh, uh, well, unfortunately, the host disabled participation, participant screen sharing. I would like to return to the opportunity to uh, share the screen. I do need it.
Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see the, the shared screen. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Can you, can you okay. put it on full, full screen, please? Somehow, uh, all very difficult. Okay, I, I shall skip what I have um, what I have been talking about, I think I have uh, uh, stopped at where uh, we had the... Irina, can you make it a full, uh, full screen, please? Sorry? Can you make it, sorry? Full, can you make it full screen? Uh, I was hoping that that is what it is. Let me try. Yeah, just the icon at the bottom. Um, yeah, I can see it. I'm trying to press it, but it doesn't uh, doesn't work. Okay, let me try again. Okay, we can. It doesn't matter. We can. We can see what's happening. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, I was speaking about the Russian uh, International Affairs Council and its appreciation of the uh, situation in uh, South Africa in terms of relations uh, uh, with or attitude uh, to the Ukrainian war, uh, to the war in Ukraine. Uh, and I stopped where, uh, uh, where I said that uh, uh, the uh, council noted that the uh, South African media is largely controlled by the Western corporations, and that's why it does not reflect uh, on the sentiments of the local population. So uh, the Russians said that gave examples of uh, uh, who, in their view, uh, did reflect uh, the uh, uh, sentiments of the local. on the issue. One was the developments in Ukraine and the framework of monopoly uh, capitalism are linked to the United States, NATO and EU plans and their intervention in the region. Uh, then uh, uh, an impression
appointed uh, the former president and his supporters. Uh, uh, this is the quote. Jacob Zuma expressed that the current crisis should be seen in the context of the dynamics of the balance of power on the global scale. Uh, he said that such countries as, Ru as Russia and China evoke admiration when they have managed to protect their territories from Western countries. And his daughter, Abudu, uh, uh, has uh, launched the hashtag uh, uh, Stand with Russia, demonstrating for support for Russia's actions. Action. Well, you remember that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the connection between this lady and uh, the riots last year, the riots uh, were seemingly established by the South African police, but they obviously did not. Uh, then uh, uh, there was one, also another issue, which uh, almost all of these groups reflected on, and uh, that was uh, the uh, purportedly uh, reportedly uh, racist attitudes uh, in Ukraine. This was particularly uh, the EFF and uh, Zuma. Uh, racist attitudes uh, 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 of Ukraine towards black Africans uh, uh, when uh, uh, there were some, uh, some information in the media uh, that there was on the border from people who were trying to escape from Ukraine. Uh, on the borders, there were uh, sort of uh, the, the, the people on the borders discriminated between the Africans and uh, the Ukrainians and the uh, whites. Uh, nobody noted uh, that, uh, meanwhile, uh, there were actually about 80,000 uh, foreigners, particularly from Asian and Western countries, uh, starting that the students who started in Ukraine and the Africans. Uh, uh, we're not unhappy there. There were about 10,000 of them uh, before the war, and they came, they were heaven and wanted to stay. Uh, the uh, motive that guide, the sen sentiments that guide all these uh, parties are absolutely obvious. They are the same. Uh, they um, uh, stress the involvement of NATO. They <coughs> blame NATO and the United States. Uh, but they do not consider the interest of Ukraine at all. Uh, this is the Russian narrative, and uh, uh, the Ukrainians do not exist in this narrative. So, uh, there is a permanent and constant repetition of uh, uh, this chemical and biological weapon spectrum in Ukraine. Uh, I must say that uh, I have never heard anything like that, that uh, blatantly fake uh, on uh, Russia, TV, Russia TV RT. Uh, but in uh, the Russian media itself, uh, some of the notions are repeated, for example, about the biological and chemical weapons. And obviously, this information uh, is seen through. Uh, now, does this represent uh, the Europa? There are also similar anti Western sentiments. In uh, uh, the far right circles, I have never seen any information in the media about it, but conversations with uh, uh, some older, uh, older uh, Africanists uh, that believe uh, that uh, their attitude from the West is uh, uh, absolutely the same. Russia is much better, Putin is much better just because he challenges the West. This is a strange coincidence of uh, uh, the ultra left and the ultra right. But let me repeat uh, practically all of the points 
that uh, uh, the uh, Russian uh, authorities uh, in this situation uh, depict is uh, uh, the global situation. The global situation is changing and it needs to be changed and rapidly reset in that. Elizabeth mentioned veterans, and there are many of them. Uh, this is um, uh, a memory which is very dear to them uh, because they really uh, think and uh, uh, consider uh, Russia's assistance as uh, are crucial uh, in uh, the defeating or in the defeat of apartheid. They also know that Western governments were not on their side in that struggle. Uh, the collective West uh, is uh, uh, for uh, the significant element of the ANC following uh, is, uh, um, uh, is, uh, uh, the, is presented in uh, today's uh, in today's West. Uh, it is the government policy that is remembered. They do not remember that there was a very strong anti-apartheid movement and uh, uh, that significant portions of Western population supported anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, they also do not remember that positions of different uh, countries varied and that also it changed over time. It's just the West that is uh, uh, bad in this situation, which did not help uh, us to fight apartheid. That is how the memory works. And it is not just ideology. It is uh, the real memory for many. For many, the struggle against apartheid was also only a part of a larger struggle against colonialism and imperialism. And that is certainly associated with the West. The very fact that Russia challenges the West makes it a representative of all of the opposites, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, and new, a new and better world, a uh, multipolar world. And uh, uh, just as uh, so many ANC cadres did not really know what sociali socialism were, was, uh, they did not know uh, uh, the uh, real life under socialism. Uh, so uh, in the same way, they do not have idea, an idea of what this better world is going to look. Uh, a multipolar global work in Russia's terms uh, looks more like a new uh, Cold War uh, situation. And uh, this has already been mentioned as a second Cold War. This is exactly what Russian actions uh, 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 will result in, uh, whether we want it or not, or whether Russian wa Russia wants it or not. Uh, the collective West, headed by the United States, is playing for its it's paying for its long predominance in the unpop in the unipolar world after the collapse of the USSR. Uh, Russia presents itself as a fighter for a new, uh, fair, multipolar world. Now, what I mean by uh, uh, the uh, collective West and United States, first of all, are paying for uh, their long predominance in this unipolar world. Uh, there were many mistakes uh, uh, which uh, uh, the uh, uh, the United States or NATO or other Western countries made uh, in uh, uh, their foreign uh, policy in their international relations during that time. It seemed that this new global order, unipolar, would last forever. And so it was permissible uh, to intervene and double standards were permissible it and of course they resented it. Uh, uh, even uh, partially, the Russia's uh, uh, the Russia's uh, uh, move uh, towards uh, this anti-Westernism uh, already starting in the late 1990s. Uh, uh, was uh, provoked to a certain extent by the arrogance to which 
uh, the Russia was treated as a defeated country, uh, whilst uh, the Russians themselves uh, 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 thought that it was not defeated. Nobody defeated Russia. They defeated the order that existed in Russia, which they thought was unfair at that time. Uh, but what followed was even more difficult, and they resented being treated with contempt and arrogance, and who wouldn't? Uh, so, yes, uh, the West is paying for that arrogance, and uh, it was obvious to me even at that time that such a moment would come. But also, there are other factors which uh, uh, brought this situation and this uh, attitudes uh, among so many Africans to the present situation. Uh, one is that in the last decade, Russia dramatically increased its military presence in Africa, positioning itself as a defender of law and order and a selfless fighter against terrorism. Uh, if you think about Central African Republic, about Mali, Russia is incredibly popular uh, there. Uh, because after so many decades of war and uh, uh, of war and uh, uh, terror uh, and poverty. Uh, well, poverty didn't go anywhere, but at least uh, the order that was uh, uh, established in, for example, the Central African Republic, whether it is democratic or not democratic, does not worry the population. Whether it is uh, 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 whether it is uh, uh, observes human rights or doesn't observe human rights, for now, uh, the population of the, uh, of the Central African Republic does not uh, object to that order, at least not strongly. They are starting to notice, but that's a different matter altogether. Uh, then, uh, of course, Russia is very popular in Mali uh, because it helps uh, fight against terrorism. Uh, uh, the Russians do not recognize that they, they have uh, uh, their troops there. They don't have the troops. Uh, they have the Wagner Group. Uh, but uh, uh, the Russians do not, depending on the situation, they do recognize that they have this Wagner group or do not recognize that they have it. They are, or generally speaking, that such things exist. Uh, uh, in the last decade, uh, Russia has also improved its diplomacy and intensified its propaganda, presenting itself as a participant, if not a leader, of the new deep decolonization, decolonization of the mind. This is an incredibly powerful narrative among African intellectuals and some politicians. Uh, uh, in many African countries, not only in South Africa, but in South Africa, if we uh, if we, for example, remember what um, Lindy was a Sulu uh, in her uh, attack on the constitution was saying, uh, was uh, uh, something quite similar. Today, uh, in the high echelons of our judicial system, uh, these mentally colonized Africans, we have a neoliberal constitution. Uh, uh, with foreign aspiration, inspirations, but were the African value system, but uh, in this co co constitution, uh, but where uh, is the African value system in this constitution uh, and the rule of law? If the law doesn't work for Africans in Africa, then what is the use of the rule of law? Uh, Russia has been uh, uh, doing, uh, uh, has been making uh, a number of clips uh, which uh, uh, dissociated with any notion of colonization. Uh, one was called the why you should not uh, allow, uh, why you should not support the uh, United States and NATO. Uh, lure, lure Ukraine to fight Russia. So Ukraine 
uh, does not have an agency in their view. Uh, but why shouldn't uh, you support United States and NATO? And that is because Russia has never been uh, a colonized uh, uh, colonial, sorry, col colonial country. Uh, it has never had colonies in Africa, it says. It has never uh, had any African slaves. Uh, it did not participate. Recording uh, in it progress. It has never been, uh, it has never been uh, uh, a member, of, uh, mistakenly, the clip says that uh, Russia did not participate in the Berlin Conference, which started colonization of the African continent. Uh, uh, some of it is true, some of it is not. But of course, nobody speaks about Russia's internal policy. Uh, nobody speaks about Russia's policy towards its close neighbors. So uh, that is the narrative that has been propelled. And uh, deep decolonization uh, has now become uh, a kind of a uh, catch word uh, at many conferences which uh, the Russians organize uh, together with uh, some African politicians and leaders. Uh, so for some, the present struggle is for decolonization, decolonization of the mind. And uh, for many South Africans, uh, uh, particularly uh, within the ANC following, particularly within the AEFF following, particularly on the left, probably without any following, the anti-Western sentiment is very strong uh, because they still are fighting for decolonization. Uh, so part of the population is decolonizing. The other part of South Africa uh, is uh, uh, trying to build uh, a, a different country, democratic country, which uh, is based on the rule of law. Uh, but as we can see, even from the cabinet, uh, that uh, such things are not necessarily good enough for uh, the ANC following. So this is where in this polarized uh, South Africa and in this polarized, uh, uh, I wish by the way that somebody did this uh, poll uh, and found out uh, really what percentage of the population of South Africa is uh, supporting South Africa's uh, uh, foreign policy. I think that it would be quite popular. So this is the balancing act uh, which uh, South Africa's government is engaged in. And uh, this is uh, uh, a very important, uh, uh, this is a very important factor which defines uh, the policy of the South African government, not just uh, uh, the international law, not just the constitution, not just the practical consideration. But even if we speak uh, about uh, uh, practical cons considerations, uh, look, uh, I'm not an economist and I do not specialize in these things, but uh, just look at this uh, 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 tiny sample of figures. Uh, uh, Russian, uh, uh, European trade, both uh, ways, uh, trade with South Africa uh, actually uh, tramples both the Russians and uh, Russian and Ukrainian trade. But if you compare the importance of Russia uh, for the economy and Ukraine, for the South African economy, they are incomparable. Of course, Russia's uh, uh, Russian uh, trade is absolutely minuscule compared to Germany's, uh, China's, uh, and uh, other European countries. But but uh, 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 still, Ukrainian portion is still smaller. Uh, so although Ukraine. Uh, uh, exports very important uh, grain for South Africa, but still uh, Russia exports more. Uh, 
uh, and imports also more. Uh, in this second Cold War, uh, what is uh, uh, the South Africans' uh, priorities? Uh, Elizabeth said completely rightly, yes, this is national interest. Uh, but what does it see as a national interest? Uh, there are quite a number of things uh, uh, that South Africa can get out of this situation uh, of the cold of the new Cold War. It is actually the opportune moment. Uh, there was a mysterious stately woman visit uh, a couple of days ago, which was uh, reported by News 24, uh, who uh, came on a plane uh, which is registered in the name of Medvedev's uh, former prime minister and former president uh, uh, wife. But uh, judging by the description, she was not uh, Svetlana Medvedeva. So she came for, for two days. What was discussed? W why did she came? Uh, why did she come? Uh, was what can uh, were there any other secret meetings like that or open meetings? After all, uh, Putin and, uh, uh, and uh, Ramaphosa spoke twice, uh, which was proudly noted by uh, the um, international, Russian International Relations Council, Affairs Council. Uh, maybe it can get cheap fuel uh, maybe it can get cheaper grain. Uh, these are the deals which other countries are following, India, for example. Uh, maybe it can get more vegetable oil, uh, but also there are other opportunities which can arise, uh, such as uh, uh, prospecting for Antarctic sea, uh, Antarctic gas. Uh, there are several countries that control that area and is among them, uh, United States, European Union, China, Russia, but Russia is the only one uh, who, against the agreement, uh, oral agreement, admittedly, but there was an agreement prospecting for Antarctic gas. So why can't South Africa give, give it a platform for that? Uh, now, finally, of course, uh, maybe Russia can uh, can share its uh, experience of election technologies, so-called. Uh, that is the specific ways of uh, uh, winning elections. Yes, there are these opportunities, and I'm sure that some of them uh, uh, South African government will follow because it is in its uh, national interests. Uh, but will the ANC and the government uh, keep, preserve its moral high ground. I put the question mark here because to a very large extent, it depends uh, on uh, uh, how the war ends. And we do not know how it ends. Uh, David was absolutely uh, correct when he said that this is an open end war. Uh, so maybe it will end in such a way that moral high grounds do not exist anymore, but it can end in a very different way. And uh, then the ANC, despite the fact that its uh, following doesn't like South African media, mainstream media, despite the fact that it doesn't uh, accept what uh, the West is saying, uh, maybe the war will end in such a way uh, that the ANC will lose this high moral high ground, which it did have in the previous Cold War. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irina. That was a fascinating uh, analysis of the relationship between South Africa and Russia and the different factions involved in, in determining policy. Thank you so much. We're now going to go straight through to our panel discussion. I want to ask uh, Professor Matibule to come to the podium to lead the discussion. And uh, 
Elizabeth Sideropoulos and, and Mark Oppenheimer to participate in the, in the panel debate. You'll see that in front of you, you have cards. If you want to ask a question, please write the question down and we'll collect them and give them to uh, Lucky Matabule and he'll put them to the, to the uh, panel. Good afternoon, I think it's afternoon already. And uh, introduced, my name is Lucky. And um, I'm, I have the easiest job in this conference to allow people to ask questions and allow others to answer. You know, <laughs> that's a very easy job that I have. But I just want to, to preface my facilitation with a story uh, in Hamann's Grab. Uh, it's a place uh, north of Pretoria. They don't have water there. And uh, it's, it's in a class, a mathematics class. And uh, a mathematics teacher comes from mainstream township. Uh, I would say. And Hamas Kral is, it's, 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 it's peri urban but more moving towards rural. Then the mathematics teacher asked a question to the kids and he said, if there are five goats this side of the street and two of them cross to the other side, how many goats will remain on the other side? And uh, one of the children then said to the teacher, you first have to tell me if the two that jump, is there a male goat on the other two? And then the teacher said, yes said, okay, nothing will remain that side because all of them are going to follow him. <laughs> you get the story. Nothing will remain because all of them are going to follow it. Then he said, but what if the goat is, is on the other side? He said, those two will never jump. The moral of the story is that when we deal with things like taking sides, it depends on the context because the child was correct. It's true. Uh, when the male goat jumps, all of them follow. And if it doesn't jump, they don't follow. So in this thing that we are dealing with today, we need to know that there are contexts that are informing certain policies. Uh, there are generations that are in charge of our government. And there's a generation that practically most of them spend time in a lot of Eastern universities and they owe their allegiance to their degrees and what they know to the Eastern uh, way of living. And there are some amongst them that went to the West. And uh, potentially, if somebody does a proper analysis of the functions, you'll find that those ideological features are actually reflected in the way the ANC is finding its divisions today. And that spreads into government. Uh, your DERCO, most of the officials in that department are from exile. Most of the leading ones are from exile. And they have that orientation of the Cold War more than, then you go to Treasury, you find boys that are trained here, you know? Uh, your Vista University, Techies University boys. So those are the dynamics which people don't talk about. You go to DPSA, you find your vet university trained, your PNDM boys, they are there. Uh, you go to provincial governments, you get. So you find that there are a lot of orientations in the public service that are informing one's policy or the other. If you want to know 
if you want to know how um, uh, Max Swilling is still dominant in, uh, in Gauteng, you, you, you go into the departments in Gauteng, you find Max Swilling thinking is there, it's deep. Uh, you go to some departments in Pretoria, you find Tekis is dominant there. The new guy on the block, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's Masiru Mule from, from uh, uh, Tswani University of Technology. He's churning a lot of doctorates out of the system and they're moving into these senior positions. So that's the challenge about characterizing decisions from South Africa. So let me take questions. I just wanted to give you, uh, my context is the goats in, uh, in, uh, in Haman's ground that uh, it was the child wrong to say no goat is going to cross or no goat is going to remain? And was the teacher wrong to say when two goats cross out of five, three remain? So both answers are correct, but it depends on what context you are doing. I just wanted us to have that, uh, that thing without saying must not take a side. Um, I have a question here. They say, in a world before, in a world where a values-based legal order is being challenged, do you f foresee the possibility of carving a space for traditional good such as humanitarian assistance? Do I have to report to repeat? In a world where a value-based legal order is being challenged, do you see? Now, do you foresee the possibility of carving, carving a space for traditional goods such as humanitarian assistance? That's the first one. I hope you, you just make note. And uh, uh, Prof. Irene, I hope you are also listening to these questions. And uh, I wonder, yeah, yeah, please, yeah. I hope you are listening to the questions. And uh, the second one is how is the yeah, no D handwriting, it's interesting. <laughs> how is the two SP? Is it two SP? ZSP. ZSP, okay. Zimb is it the Zimbabwean special dispensation? Are you saying that? Yeah, Zimbabwean special dispensation permit Okay, can I ask that this, I can't see well here. I have a challenge of this handwriting. Can you, can my panelist, uh, please when I stop you, you must stop uh, so that I can allow other people to, to talk. And if you really think you want to ask a question from, but I don't go into allow them. I can't see this one. Okay. Uh, the second one, because I want two questions, so that you all handle two questions. Uh, Pro-Russian, uh, will pro-Russian interest, no, pro-Russian historic and ideological interest count for more than South Africa's overwhelming trade and financial relations with the West? This is a good one. Will pro-Russian historical and ideological interest count for more than South Africa's overwhelming trade and financial relations? That's the second question. The last question, foreign policy contradicts the values enshrined in the South African constitution. Wow, this is a statement. It starts by saying South African poli foreign policy contradicts the values enshrined in the South African constitution. It's a statement that is made in the question. In the question, then there's a question: Is it so because the um, the constitution is regarded by the ANC as a document written by a colonial mind? Three questions. Can I get uh, who's first? Can I start with her uh, uh, in the virtual world? 
Dr. Knet, and, and let me go to the cloud. Uh, Irina, are you first to start, please? Well, I can. Um, uh, look, the New World Order and the humanitarian values, uh, uh, I think I have mentioned that we do not know what this new uh, global order is going to be. Uh, we really cannot uh, judge now how and where uh, this situation will stop. I can tell you that it is quite obvious to me uh, that it is not going to be a very nice order. It is going to be rougher. Uh, it is going to be more selfish. I mean, each national interest would be more selfish. Each country would uh, protect itself by more vicious and more unscrupulous, unscrupulous means, uh, because I do remember the previous Cold War very well, and some countries could benefit from it. But humanitarian values, uh, yes, maybe they will uh, still uh, have a place in this new global order, but we don't know which order it is going to be. It all depends on that. Uh, do you want me to speak on all three questions? If you could just to give us liner, a liner on, on all of them, then we allow the other okay. panelists. Uh, Pro-Russian uh, historical and uh, ideological interest, will it count more than the South African, uh, the old South African trade? Uh, the problem is that people who decide these issues uh, base them not necessarily on uh, uh, what counts more? What counts more for them? What is in their mind? It is not past ideologies. It is not for them something that was in deep history and we are just remain loyal to it. It is the, the, their way of thinking. Their way of thinking, or many of them, is uh, that we are fighting uh, against uh, the global colonization. And actually, the third question also goes uh, uh, in line with that. Uh, we are fighting against colonization because we have a colonized mind. Uh, and actually, the uh, West is still a richer world, and we don't like that. It still interferes in our affairs, and we don't like that. Uh, so, uh, the trade is all very good, but if you come to the questions of uh, these volumes of trade with the notion that you have to fight against this uh, order, uh, and uh, probably you think that if you change the global order, your trade uh, would, would uh, mean much more to the West than it does uh, now, uh, maybe you will benefit from that. Uh, so uh, the de decolonization means uh, much more to the mind and perceptions and sensibilities of so many uh, people who are in government and uh, uh, generally speaking uh, quite a high proportion uh, of South African population as far as I can see. Uh, okay. So the same refers to the constitution. The constitution was written in terms of the international law, in terms of uh, the international perceptions of uh, the uh, global world order of which South Africa desperately wanted at that time to be and wanted to be accepted on equals. Uh, uh, if the global order changes well, probably the constitution becomes outdated. Probably the new South Africa will not need any constitution at all. Uh, that I do not know. It's for the South wow. Africans to see. Right. Okay. Wow, that's a very strong one. We probably won't need this constitution if the global order changes. Okay, let me hear your comment, even on this last statement. Uh, can you start? Uh, is it Lisbeth? Yeah, sure. Yes. I, can, I, can, I can start. Um, on, let me start with the first, uh, the first question around humanitarian assistance, value-based legal order. I think um, if, if, the, if, if the case of Ukraine and the way in which humanitarianism has been allowed or not allowed uh, to operate is any indication, it's going to become much more difficult. So you are going to have these, uh, these rules and norms around humanitarianism. 
and the ICRC is going to, uh, to be a proponent and, and to fight for them, but it won't necessarily be able to adhere to them or those values uh, in certain contexts where countries like Russia can actually, uh, can actually uh, ob ob obstruct. And just an observation uh, around uh, also the point that I think Irina made also in her presentation around multipolarity. The irony is that you know, a, a, a world that is governed or managed by one hegemon is always, a, is, is always not a nice place for some people. Um, but there is very clear direction. <laughs> When you have a multipolar world, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be more multilateral. Okay? A more multipolar world makes multilateralism actually even more complicated. And I think this is what we're facing now. And a lot of these norms, which, you know, certainly the humanitarianism is one that shouldn't be up for question. But it is, because all of these are contested and some can flout them. I mean, that's the whole point. Some can flout and others can't. Um, and and, and I, so we will probably see an inconsistent application. On the second question around uh, the, the, the trade, the financial relations, etc. I mean, to add to, uh, to that point, I suppose the, the critical question here is, is what, what, are there now immediate consequences that South Africa is facing from its European and American partners by not by abstaining, for example, uh, in, the, in the three UN uh, General Assembly votes? Um, the answer is no. Um, might it affect uh, relations in the future? You, you highlighted a Goa. Um, I think a Goa is going to be affected, but not because of the war in Ukraine. I think a Goa is going to be affected uh, because I think the, the trade environment in, in America has changed. It's become much more protectionist. Um, it, it, uh, it sees South Africa as an upper middle income country. And while a Goa might survive in other parts of the continent, it is likely that South Africa is not going to be a beneficiary, but it's not going to be because of the war in Ukraine. Um, so there's also that element and the cost uh, and the sort of uh, the assessment of, of what the likelihood is of immediate sanctions on that. I mean, speaking to a number of, of, of of European embassies, for example, the fact that South Africa has taken that position, uh, which is, you know, which hasn't been what the Europeans wanted South Africa to take, doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a wholesale uh, departure of, of European companies, of, of which there are many, there are very important investors in South Africa. As a result of that, they have uh, economic interests and, and, you know, they've been in the country for a long time. So there's also that dimension. Um, uh, so yes, at one level we should think these are our important economic partners, we should go with them, but the other side says, but they're not going to go anywhere very quickly. I mean, we see that in other contexts as well. It's very difficult once you, when you've got direct investment to just up and leave uh, uh, because you disagree on, on, on a human rights principle. I mean, that's, that's unfortunately the, the, the case. And then on the last uh, question, um, I mean, that's a, that's a really depressing <laughs> statement from Irina. Um, but I think it's important to note that the Constitution was a product of the end of history narrative. Eh? It was a uh, triumph of liberal democracy. Um, and I hope that, <laughs> I hope we don't revisit it. Um, because I think um, while one might say that many of these, uh, these, uh, these themes and, 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 and thoughts may have originated in the West, they also had significant resonance in the South. In fact, the whole decol uh, decolonization was about recognizing many of these rights. Um, and I think we, we sometimes forget that for very short-term political uh, expediency, and we do that at our peril, uh, I'm, I, I must say. On the issue of foreign policy contradicting values, you know, the fact of the matter is it's very difficult. There is no country in this world, and we should stop beating ourselves, <laughs> there is no country in the world that follows an entirely moralistic foreign policy. It would be great if they did, but nobody does. Uh, and we are no exception. Can we do better on some of the choices that we make in terms of the trade-offs? Absolutely. Are we the exception? No, we're not. So maybe let me leave it there. Okay. So history has not yet 
ended. <laughs> Fukuyama is challenged by reality. Yes. Let, let's see, uh, is it uh, Mark. Mark? So there's a, there's a danger in proclaiming the end of history. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think when Francis Fukuyama came out to South Africa to speak about this, you know, he sort of chuckled that uh, you know, he was wrong in thinking that we've now reached the zenith and everyone will agree. Um, but there's also a danger in discarding the important liberal values that many have fought for and have you know, fought to entrench in our constitution. And there is this narrative that's alluded to that, well, the constitution really is a document of betrayal, uh, mm. that it was written with a colonial mindset, uh, that it's a sellout constitution, and really what we need to do is tear it up and you know, have some new kind of revolutionary document. And partly why this is dangerous is that it's, there's something so sinister with saying that freedom, dignity, and equality only belong to the West. Uh, these are values that matter for all people regardless of where they live. Um, that it is important if you are South American or if you're African that you want your dignity respected, that you want an equal opportunity to compete that you want to be able to freely express your, your ideas and live an autonomous life. The idea that these are values for white Europeans uh, is rather outrageous. The Constitution really is a document in some senses that odds with itself. So it, it does try and cater for a variety of interests. It protects multi multiple groups. Um, we protect a variety of languages, uh, at least in, in principle, if not in practice. And I think one of the precipices that we got very close to, to walking into was uh, to remove one of the most fundamental parts of our constitution being the property rights section. And you, know, you, you can see how uh, taking this radical line um, was bad for everybody. So you had a lack of investment in South Africa during that time, you see the Rand dip. Um, when we think about foreign companies that operate in South Africa, I think Vested interests always take a view of, well, we're here, we've spent money, we should try and you know, maintain the status quo. But that only tells you half the story. What about all the people that aren't investing? You know, those European diplomats and American diplomats that are here you know, want to keep the existing relationships up, but are they telling companies back home, so Africa's a wonderful place, the property rights will be respected, you know, this is the place to invest. They aren't. We aren't seeing this new investment. We sort of cling on to the status quo. And so there's all this lost opportunity, all these jobs that could be created that we're missing out on. And part of it is because of this radical rhetoric against property rights, against liberal values, and against the Constitution. I suppose if we read ARENA correctly, this idea that our Constitution will have no value uh, in the event of you know, nuclear World War III, uh, I think there's, there's something to be said for that. Uh, but I think we're, we're nowhere near the apocalypse. What's interesting is how during the last apocalypse we had, the COVID pandemic, um, our constitution played an important role. Uh, that as much as the governing party tried to erode people's rights, uh, civil society could um, go to court, they could fight some of the uh, totalitarian streaks that we found, uh, and they could be successful in the courts. And that the reason was because we have a constitution that protects our rights. That our constitution even foresees that it will uh, continue in state of emergency. That not all rights can be taken away. Uh, the state can't suddenly introduce summary ex executions, for example. There's certain rights that are foundational that can't be taken away. So even if we do have, you know, utter chaos, uh, there's something to be said for the rule of law and there's something to be said for clinging on to those values. On this question around aid and, um, and values, um, Barack Obama had an interesting line, which is that it's in America's interest to provide aid to certain parts of the world because it will lead to stability, uh, because it's less likely um, to to have terrorist groups coming out of uh, countries that we assist. Uh, and so there's a sense in which you can marry these twin aims uh, of you know, a liberal democracy uh, and, and providing aid. But aid might not be the best way of addressing global poverty. Desmond Tutu said that you know, what you really want is uh, freedom of trade, not just aid. Um, and what you want is a lifting of, of trade barriers so that Africa can export its goods um, that's a much better way of having sustainable growth in a country instead of having your hand out and asking for, for money from other countries, which will then necessarily come with strength. So I think creating a climate of growth uh, is going to be more important than seeking aid from others. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to ask the last three questions, and then I'm going to ask uh, 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 Mwelezi to, to also come to, to say something. Um, before I ask this question, you know, I was at one of the lodges. You know, I like, I like South Africa, so I, it has very nice nature lessons. So I was at the lodge and, uh, in Limpopo, uh, in Barambat area. The name of the lodge is uh, Mabalingwe. It's just a stone's throw away from the lodge that is in the news. Uh, you know, it's a stone's throw, literally. It's, 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 it's a street and then there's palapala there. So I was in Mabalingwe. And uh, as I was watching that, I saw a very beautiful springbok. Very beautiful. And when I went to the lodge and to sleep, and I was sitting there watching TV, relaxed, then I saw a National Geographic. And the lion was attacking a similar springbok. Now I was conflicted. I, I love the way the lion is attacking, and yet I also love the springbok. I think these are issues of foreign policy. Do you agree with me? That we might love how other countries are, are very uh, uh, aggressive in their foreign policy because the lion had an interest to, to, to get protein. And the beautiful springbok had an interest to be alive. And both those interests are important to the two species. But one depends on the other to be alive, and one depends on its speed to be alive. So in a world where there is unipolar, one big power and small guys, we run and we do that. But what South Africa has been able to successfully do over the years was to wear a beautiful mask of another lion when it was a springbok. And we started punching a little bit over our, our weight. And the Mandela dividend and the way our transition went, we started to believe that everything we say, people take us serious. When they took us serious when we were fighting apartheid, after apartheid, they're expecting to hear from us, but what's the value proposition are you giving to the world? And I think we have not answered that question to date. And that impacts on our foreign policy to say, what is our value proposition to the world? Except liberation, rhetoric, and decoloniality. Uh, I'm going to ask these three questions and then my panelists. Do you see the chance for the military cooperation between South Africa and a Western power like AUKUS, is it AUKUS or huh? AUKUS, yeah. A military power like AUKUS, and could this shift South African policy towards the West? Let me repeat the question to my panelists. Do you see the chance for a military cooperation between South Africa and a Western power like AUKUS? And could this shift South African policy towards the West? Second. Does the panel think Russia's invasion may open the way to other invasions? Taiwan? Or we, yeah, we, we, we are a target for attack, by the way. We've got resources that can encourage some maverick world power to want to take us over. Um, we've got uranium and whatever. So does this thing open up for New conquest? It's a question from one of you. Uh, Prof. Arena, this one is specific to you. Uh, they say you briefly highlighted the use of social media as a way to communicate with the public. Can you expand on how we can use these platforms 
for our foreign policy. It doesn't mean you're excluded in answering that, but it was specifically to her. Let me take your quick responses to these three questions, and then I want to invite Mwelezi, and then after that I want to wrap up and hand over to Dave. Uh, let me start in Jobek. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to, to KZN. I still have infrastructure program, problems to arrive there. You just said the climate change flood. <laughs> Lisbon. Okay, on, on, on AUKUS and, and, and South Africa, I think the, the point to make about South Africa's ability to engage in, in serious military cooperation is that certainly if anybody's been watching uh, Parliament uh, and, and the Defence uh, Portfolio Committee discussions and, and the budget vote, uh, you know, they don't, the, the, the reality is that uh, the Defence Force doesn't mince its words about its, its ability uh, to, to defend the country, uh, both in terms of its human resources as well as uh, in terms of its, of its hardware and, uh, resources. Um, and, and that affects the way in which it can do military cooperation across the board. Uh, so we, we did, uh, we did some, some work on, on this issue, looking at uh, how South Africa engages with a number of big, what we call big powers, on, on, on a range of sectors, and it included defense and military cooperation. And the fact is there's very little. There are the occasional visits of ships and things like that, and there might be the occasional joint exercises, um, but those have become much uh, fewer. And part of it relates to the fact that we have a, a defense budget that hasn't really been growing in real terms for many years. And we have an aging defense force and aging hardware uh, as well and, and things that can't take off, things that are grounded, whether it's naval uh, resources or air resources. So that's, that's, a, a, that's at a capacity level uh, in terms of any discussion about military cooperation. Now, uh, in terms of whether the Australia-UK-US agreement, which was signed, was it earlier this year or late last year, I can't remember now, uh, is, is one that South Africa might be interested in, in joining and whether that would move it, shift it more to the West. S South Africa is not in the habit, you know, in this administration uh, of joining military alliances um, of any sort. Um, uh, and even the exercises that have occurred with IPSAMAR are joint naval exercises, IPSA, India, Brazil, South Africa, but we're not in any military alliance. Clearly, South Africa has an interest in what happens in the Indian Ocean. And South Africa's interest is that it doesn't want to see a highly securitized, militarized Indian Ocean, which is, where, you know, which is part of the Indo-Pacific narrative, um, because it would rather see it in the context of its membership of the Indian Ocean Rim Association as a, as, as a space for development, for economic cooperation, that kind of thing. And so I, I believe that South Africa needs to be looking very closely at developments like AUKUS and the broader Indo-Pacific uh, uh, um, discussions with, uh, with Japan, uh, among others, um, but that, uh, because it has significant implications for our maritime security, uh, for, uh, and also, however, for, for economic cooperation and development. Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with trying to infuse that element into some of these discussions around the broad Indo-Pacific. But would it shift more to, to the West by engaging in military cooperation? It, it would not be doing military cooperation. Um, and at least not in, on, a, on a formal alliance kind of level. Um, and you know, if you look at our, our armed forces at the moment, they are much, they are very much sort of modeled on, 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 on Western sort of models of uh, you know, military doctrine and so on. It's, 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 not, you know, it's not the Chinese or the Russian. Uh, so there is a history of that, which is also just very practical. Um, Maybe, maybe I'll stop there because I know we're running out of time. Maybe others can answer other questions because I think I've gone on for Mark, a bit. I'll say something briefly about South Africa's military capacity. Go back in time exactly one year while we watched the July riots unfold and we watched shopping centers being burned to the ground, uh, civilians being killed, no army, no police. That if you think one of the fundamental roles of the state is to protect the lives of its civilians, South Africa fails on this gigantically. 
the idea that it would join a Western-driven uh, military alliance is absolutely laughable because it doesn't share the ideals and it has no capacity whatsoever. With regards to South Africa sharing its foreign policy views on social media, I think there's something quite dangerous about our politicians hanging out on Twitter. Partly because it's a, there's only so much you can say in 280 characters that you are surrounded by large numbers of fake accounts, that it's not just a matter of broadcasting information, it's about being influenced by those that you broadcast to. And so what you have is Twitter being a very hard left space with lots of militant radical people on it, critiquing, let's say, uh, middle of the road policy and pushing people in that direction. So I would much rather see our politicians stay off social media. What I would like to see would be um, our journalists getting, well, growing a spine and actually being able to interrogate government positions. What you see most of the time from, from our journalists is repeating government lines. So if you search for the term minister says, government says, you'll see that replete in articles from the mainstream media. Throughout uh, our president's sort of so-called family meetings, journalists played no role whatsoever, none. You had a government that eroded civilians' rights in dramatic fashions, you know, locked them in their homes, uh, maintained measures that the rest of the world had abandoned. No questioning from journalists because the government doesn't have that kind of relationship of reciprocity. Say what you like about Donald Trump, and there's lots to dislike about him. The guy stood there and got grilled by journalists, um, whereas our president didn't. Okay. Um, prof? Uh, well, uh, look, uh, uh, let me start from the end about the social media. Uh, unfortunately, you said, look, I'm, I'm a total uh, enemy of social media. I don't use it for communication or for information or for anything else. I fully agree that it is a disaster that some of our politicians cannot get their eyes off Twitter or whatever it is. But unfortunately, to my great regret, uh, it has become a very powerful weapon. It has become a very powerful weapon of propaganda. Uh, it has become a very powerful uh, source of information and people really do not have often any other source of information except Facebook or WhatsApp or, or TikTok or Twitter or whatever. Uh, so, yes, it is a powerful weapon, and I think that any government or, or any propaganda uh, tool uh, has to learn to use it and has to try to learn. It's actually the, uh, one of the reasons of, of the discussion uh, between Elon Musk and, and Twitter. Uh, it, it, something has to be done about the at least partial regulation of these things. Uh, but uh, it is better for any professional person who is involved in propaganda, uh, either a good propaganda or a bad propaganda for that, uh, for that matter, to, to master these uh, uh, tools, to be able to either counter them or use them. Uh, now, there was a question about other invasions uh, as a result of the... Uh, uh, Russian invasion, uh, uh, the Russian uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, it is a double-edged sword. The experience could be so negative. Uh, it could be seen as so negative that any close invasion uh, so very soon after that, probably, uh, uh, probably China would think twice about uh, invading Taiwan. After all, there are so many other, other means and ways uh, of uh, uh, trying to influence uh, uh, the country, which actually Russia was using in Ukraine. There was no need uh, uh, to, to send the troops there because there were so many pro-Russians there. I am absolutely sure that uh, uh, there would be the same situation in many other countries, including Taiwan and China. Uh, so invasion, well, maybe yes or maybe no, depending again on how this, uh, uh, this war ends. Uh, 
Uh, and finally, about military cooperation with AUKUS. Uh, and uh, of course, the question of capacity is very important. And uh, the South African army is nowhere near uh, such an alliance. Uh, but in order to actually wish for it ideologically, uh, the shift ha has to have happened already. Without a shift in mentality, in the government mentality, it would be impossible uh, for the South African government to even think in these terms. So thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, let me give that a Willis and Becky here to just make a comment, and then I will, I will do that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, thank you uh, Ambassador. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, Mrs. de Klerk, um, uh, the first point I want to make is I don't think we should leave this room uh, with the impression that there is no sympathy for the people of Ukraine uh, from, uh, from anyone in Africa. Um, there is no one who wants to see or who is not pained by the destruction of that country that we watch every day on our television. So that I think that is a point that has to be made. Having said that, uh, I think we should give the, the ambassador, if she wants to, an opportunity to talk to us. Um, I know that uh, certainly very prominent 20th century diplomats like Henry Kissinger advised Ukraine against being involved in the conflict between the West and Russia. But we have not heard what the Ukrainians themselves think of what Henry Kissinger had to say. So if, if, the, if, the, if this is possible, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think we should give the ambassador the opportunity to explain to us their point of view of how they see their situation. The second point I want to make is that, again, to, to the ambassador to communicate to her people. Russia, for us in the third world, for us in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, has been a supporter. The Russians supported the Boers during their war against the English, against England, during the Anglo-Boer War between 1899 and 1902. The Russians supported them. With our own conflicts between the African people and the whites, the Russians supported the African people. Remember, the, new, the only part of the world where nuclear weapons have been used has been outside Europe. It was in Asia, in Japan. So countries in Africa, in Asia, are afraid of the West. And what did Russia do? The one country that f most feared being attacked with nuclear weapons was China, especially after the 1949 establishment of the People's Republic of China. It was Russia that showed the Chinese how to make nuclear weapons to defend themselves. So it is very important for the people of Ukraine to understand the relationship between Russia and the rest of the non-Western world. That Russia has been supporting the non-Western world against 500 years of pillage, destruction. The destruction you see in Ukraine is very sad, but the slaughter of the Native Americans is not talked about. The slaughter of the San people, the slaughter of the Herero people. This is what the West has been doing to the non-Western world. 
So yes, we, we don't want to see this happening to Ukraine, but you have to understand, it has been happening to the rest of, the, of us for the last 500 years. The last point, Mr. Chairman, I want to make, you have to understand that we are divided in South Africa. There were those who worked with the British against the Boers and against the Zulus and against the other uh, uh, native populations. The English-speaking white South African population obviously was collaborating with the British in their control and defeat of the native peoples in South Africa. So they do not share the views of the rest of us who benefited from support from the Russians. But you have to understand that is their view, it's not the view of a large number of people in South Africa. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Um, thank you. Uh, can I ask the ambassador to, to, to come through and, uh, and let's get that, uh, that perspective. I know we also had somebody from the Taiwan, uh, but I don't see him here. But uh, let's only allow the ambassador just to give us a comment uh, in that context. I think uh, Mwelezi gave us a good uh, context on that. It's the context of the mathematics problem in your mind, right? Is it <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost, thank you. Almost, because so many times I heard today that we have to understand, so I definitely have to make my comments. Um, first of all, thank you for both uh, funds and uh, organizations for organizing this very important discussion and for our panelists to uh, expressing their views and perspectives. I think it was uh, really a meaningful and uh, um, important conversation where everyone from us will take something uh, back home. Um, it would take us quite a lot of time to hear Ukrainian perspective and I would suggest that uh, we could organize the uh, next uh, meeting, including representatives of Ukraine and myself. I am uh, always available for that. Uh, meantime, let me reflect to what just was said. Um, again, we heard uh, from one of panelists today that narrative uh, that uh, reflects uh, the uh, thinking of some part of South African society that Russia helped South Africans and Africa to fight against colonialism, against apartheid, uh, while we are not hearing another part of the story, that this is the perception which was imposing by Russia already for 30 years on African countries. It was not Russia, it was USSR. It is 15 countries, I must apologize. And a lot of particularly South Africans were studying in Ukraine, in Ukrainian Soviet Republic. That Republic who put its signature under the charter of the United Nations, not even Russia did so. And uh, when we speak about uh, more deeper history and going back to Anglo-Boer War, I must say that Ukraine already existed at that time for 10 centuries. And even Ukrainians were fighting in that war. I don't know if it's a popular thing to know and whether it's approval, um, approved uh, documentally but even Winston Churchill was liberated by Ukrainian soldier during the war. Who did know this? 
Well, um, I think that the uh, aspect of uh, nuclear power and uh, nuclear threats uh, today, it's a very important one for us to discuss, Ukraine and South Africa particularly. Why this crisis, why this war is different from all other wars that we have today and conflicts? Because one nuclear power is attacking and uh, invading non-nuclear power. But that one who abandoned its nuclear weapons for the guarantees of aggressor, and not only. So there were three countries that guaranteed Ukraine its sovereignty and territorial integrity when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons as South Africa did a long time ago. United States, Great Britain, and Russia. That's why we have to clearly understand that world to today is becoming not the safe place because no one is following the international law and the uh, agreements that the countries are binding to. Guess the number, more than 400 bilateral and international agreements to which Russia and Ukraine are assigned to were violated by Russia since 2014. Um, then the narrative about uh, how Russia uh, was supported non-Western world. It's very well known uh, in most of African countries and being Africanist. Um, by profession, I must tell you that uh, it is very uh, dangerous uh, today to divide uh, non-Western and Western world. Why we should be very cautious? Because the world is very global and becoming more and more de economically dependent. And when you look at what uh, is not only trade between Western countries and Africa, but also the support from the countries which you say Western, but they are just richer than the rest of the world for now. When you see the support that is coming to these non-European countries from European countries, then it makes sense that the lessons of history were taken, whether we should refer to the long history and blame each other for the mistakes being made, or we should adhere to the global values, to the values of democracy, for which particularly African continent were fighting and losing the life of Africans. This would be my question, which I would you to go out from this room today. And uh, of course, we all remember the history and we remember how much pain the continent had. And we remember the Herero uh, tribe and those atrocities, genocide that was happening. Why should we today in the 24th first century allow the geno genocide to repeat itself because if it repeats today in Ukraine it will repeat anywhere in the world and Africa will not be an exclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you. As they say human rights the context of human rights is always current and not historical. That's, all, that's the challenge about human rights. The, the context of human rights is always current. They are, they are demanded as they are violated at the time they are violated. And 
once you get historical about them, it becomes difficult to look at what violations are happening now. And that's the challenge that we, we have with our history. But thank you for enlightening us, um, the dimension of the USSR and, uh, and Russia. It's something that uh, uh, you have, actually you have factorized the set that supported us. That we might have been supported by the Polish there. There was, a, you know, the whole USSR. You have just factorized it. But it's important that the embassy becomes aggressive in making sure that that information goes out. What Mueletsi said, it's, 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 it's also my perception about the, the uh, Russia, not USSR, especially the story about the Anglo-Boer War, because at that time it was before the 1917 revolution. So in our mind, it's, 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 it's the Russians that were here and not the USSR. So just to work it so that people know, and South Africans are very good. When they have information, they react to information. That's why our media sometimes abuses us, because we do read what we don't like, even if they write. We, even if we don't like what they write, we read it to tell them that we don't like it, but we read it. We, 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 we don't ignore it. So if you put that information, it will be read, they will be responsive. Uh, thank you, um, Dave, and the team for selecting me to facilitate this. I, I really enjoyed the, the session. We, 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 we late for lunch, but I wanted to, 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 to share you, with you the last thing that Lem Santa, it, there's a book that Lem Santa wrote on the foxes. And when he opens that book, I think it is the preface or in the first chapter or what, he says in Africa, when in, in the African bush, when you wake up, there's a lion that wakes up, it's going to hunt for food. And there's a gazelle that wakes up and it knows that it is hunted. So in Africa, you have to choose whether you are the hunted or you are the hunter. That is what he introduces in his book, uh, is it what, The Way of the Foxes. There's a book that Santa wrote, Foxes and the Hedgehogs, yes. He introduces that that way, and I think the world is becoming that forest where there are those that are hunted and those that are hunting. And we need to say, as humanity in the world, how do we stop humanity hunting humanity uh, for no reason? Thank you. Uh, Dave, you can come through. Elita, thank you for allowing me to facilitate here. Thank you. Thank you, Lucky. And I'll just, I'd like to ask uh, our vice chairperson, Elita de Klerk, just to close the conference. And thank you to our panelists. That was a great discussion. So my, my job here is to wrap up things. I must say it was a privilege to get to know the ambassador Abravitova. Thank you and thank you to the amazing speakers. And um, I must say, Mark Oppenheimer said something, looking at the people is wonderful. Looking and listening to the people. Thank you so much. You all gave amazing speeches. And I must say, um, this is our first outing since FW's passing. And I think we did relatively well. Um, we have freedom of speech, and this freedom of speech, we thank, we owe it to our Constitution. Uh, we are free to express our ideas following the constitutional dispensation, 
in the development of South Africa, managing our, an inclusive society. Compromise and tolerance are essential if peace is to be achieved. Diplomacy is civility. It is more than good manners. It is the recognition that violent speech leads to violent deeds. Finally, in the war in Ukraine, Putin threatened catastrophic consequences for world energy markets if Western powers impose sanctions on Moscow. Let's truly hope for an end or for this war in the near future. And then I want to finish with something which I hope Mr. Putin will listen. When the power of love overcomes the power of power, the world will know peace. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, and we'd now like to invite you to join us for a, a light lunch. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers, thanks for the, to the technical team, thanks to our wonderful panel and speakers. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.